Greetings everyone, my name is Jonathan Bailey, I am from the website Plagiarism Today, which can be found at PlagiarismToday.com, and first and foremost, I'm hoping we sorted out those pesky audio issues that plagued the last video. It's really amazing what can seem so perfect in the test runs, and yet so, so wrong when you upload it to YouTube. But on that note, we have a lot to go over this time. There are some big, big developments in the H3H3 lawsuit, and if we're going to get through it, we need to get moving pretty quickly. It's also actually really, really impressive. I missed a lot in about the month or so that I have been away from this case, so we're going to have to jump in. But first, a quick recap of the lawsuit for those who do not know, or maybe you're just now learning about it. H3H3 is a popular channel. It's run by Ethan and Gila Klein. They actually run two channels, and it was on that second channel that they posted a video where they made fun of one Matt Haas, I'm not even attempting to pronounce his full last name, better known as the bold guy as he does these very bizarre pickup videos that I just flat don't understand, but they found great humor in it and they did a video lampooning it. He took umbrage to this and after some back and forth filed a suit for copyright infringement. Now when we last left off, um, the Kleins had just responded to the initial, well I should say technically the amended complaints if you'll recall. Um, Haas, and, Haas and his attorneys had filed one complaint, and then before there was even a response, had amended it. So now they had responded to the amended complaint with a motion to dismiss. Now a motion to dismiss, once again to recap, is where you say that this lawsuit, even if we assume everything is A-OK -okay and we don't dispute any of the facts, there is no claim for relief. There is no reason this lawsuit should move forward. Well, that motion to dismiss is where we leave things because the this is what has happened since then. This is actually the PACER documentation from it. Everything in that neat little red rectangle there is what we're going to have to cover today. We're going to start with the declaration and opposition of the motion to dismiss, basically the response to the motion to dismiss, and then some legal stuff that happened after, and then the second amended complaint followed by the answer to it. So, needless to say, we have a lot going on. Now, when the clients filed their motion to dismiss, the main thing they attacked was the copyright registration. Now, if you'll recall last time, we talked about how under the U.S. law, a copyright registration is required for a court to have jurisdiction in the case. No copyright registration, no case. Ergo, it would be thrown out, theoretically. Now, the problem is Matt does have a copyright registration, and he has included it repeatedly with the documentation. It's a bit unusual, because like I've said previously, the copyright registration system in the United States completely stinks. It is totally impractical for YouTubers and bloggers and anyone else who does recurring, rapidly updating content. And it did make sense to poke holes in it. After all, um, H3HRE's attorneys were right to point out these issues, because if they can get the lawsuit dismissed on that, it's over very, very quickly and cheaply, and much to their client's benefit. But Matt Haas and the, his lawyers responded to this, and what they pointed out, and this is actually very interesting, is that when Haas filed for the copyright registration, he actually had correspondence with the U.S. Copyright Office. This is just a snapshot of it here. The long and short of it is, that you can read, if you read the entire documentation, once again, I'm putting PDFs to at least the key documents below. I don't know which ones I'm including or not including. I've got a lot here to throw up there. But the bottom line is, when he communicated with the U.S. Copyright Office, the Copyright Office seemed to agree that this was an appropriate way to register his videos. Because if you remember, he was registering them not only as a collection, a bunch of videos that he uploaded over a period of time, he was uploading them as, and registering them rather as one collection, but also registering them as an unpublished collection. And that unpublished part was one of the controversies that the attorneys for the clients hit upon. Because in their view, publishing to YouTube is published. However, that's not necessarily true, and it's because of how bizarre and antiquated U.S. copyright law is. You see, under U.S. copyright law, a work is considered published if copies are distributed for sale, lease, or lending. That doesn't happen with streaming, and in fact, basically, the U.S. Copyright Office has said that merely uploading it to a streaming site does not count as publishing. However, rulemaking from the U.S. Copyright Office has found that if you have share buttons, which pretty much all YouTube channels do, then it could be considered publication because at that point you're encouraging the distribution of copies. It's very wonky stuff and it just goes to show how out of date and out of touch our copyright registration system is. That dichotomy of published versus unpublished is completely meaningless and pointless in 2016 
and it needs to die because it seems to be causing a lot of confusion. Regardless, we have to move on. So basically, Haas said that he talked to the USCO and they approved this method of registration. That's why they gave him the registration certificate. Now, the problem with that is the USCO is not binding. Courts do not have to follow their advi the, the advice of the USCO, the U.S. Copyright Office. Instead, they're free to ignore it. <clears throat> While they do tend to listen and take seriously the advice of the U.S. Copyright Office, like I said, no legally binding stuff here, and a lot of that has to do because the U.S. Copyright Office is under a different branch of the government. If you go back to your civics class, the Copyright Office is under the Library of Congress. It's not, you know, a, it's not a part of the legal branch of the government, so to speak. So, interesting stuff there. But all of that's pretty much moot because what happened next is the two parties got together and they decided that what was going on was kind of crazy. They went through a pretrial motion and initially it was decided that the motion to dismiss would be converted into a motion for summary judgment. And that actually made sense because that copyright registration is what's known as prima facie evidence. Basically what that means is Matt Haas has presented this registration. If he, if the clients wish to disprove that, the burden of proof is on them. So that's an argument that's typically beyond the scope of a motion to dismiss, and this was something I was thinking about after I got done with the previous video, but I digress. The long and short of it is they, they decided to convert it to a motion for summary judgment. However, that's not happening either because shortly after all that pretrial hearing stuff and all that get-together stuff, this happened. The attorneys for both sides got together and they reached sort of an agreement, and this happens a fair amount in cases where sort of like the case maybe is in danger of going off the rails a little bit or there's something going on and they realized they were in danger of doing a lot of redundant work. So what happened here, and you can just read the one, two, three, this is basically the text of the letter if you want to pause it here and skim through it, but the defendants, i.e. the Kleins, withdrew their motion to dismiss completely, or the motion, well at that point it was a motion for summary judgment I guess, but they withdrew the motion completely. They granted consent for Haas to file a second amendment, a second amended complaint, words Jonathan, um, and they did so on July 22nd, and then on August 5th, the defendants would file their response. So, where does that leave us? Well, we then first have the second amended complaint, as you can see here. Um, this was filed by Haas's attorneys, and it's largely the same as the so the first amended complaint, which in turn was largely the same as the original complaint. But the bottom line, the main difference is that this complaint adds a claim of defamation. Basically, what Matt Haas is claiming is that in the video in which in the videos in which H3H3 has been talking about Haas and this lawsuit, they have committed some degree of defamation. It's a little vague. You can see the part about where he speaks about his claim for relief here on defamation. He's not very specific about what statements were defamatory, so it's a little bit confusing to me, and I'm trying to really wrap my head around this. But long and short of it is, he's claiming that statements by the Kleins were somehow defamatory, and as a result, he received a great deal of hate mail. And here's one of the interesting things. He actually, in one of the filings, included, and this is just a snapshot of it, a snapshot of just some of the hate mail he's gotten. These are Facebook comments from the, from the look. No, these are YouTube comments. I put, YouTube and Facebook. Okay, that's why I'm getting confused. There's both inter, intermingled. Um, but yeah, some of the comments he's received. And so here's the thing. I'm going to just trust that none of my viewers were going off and saying you know, horrible things and trolling on his channel, but if you were, and you might want to stop, because now that defamation is in, is in play here, it's entirely possible that if this goes off the rails and there is some kind of defamatory statement in there, I'm not saying there is, like I said, he didn't specify much of anything that I can see that was defamatory, but if there is, and you know, you're the one. You're one of the ones posting these these types of things. You might actually be hurting the clients. So something to think about in this case. The actions of others can have an impact. In this case, by increasing the damages and the harm in which he has received. Something to ponder. Now, the clients on the fifth responded to that amended complaint, and here's just a sample of it. 
basically a response to a complaint like this is a very, very bizarre thing. If you go back to, and I'm going to pull up the uh, second amendment complaint, you see how at the very bottom there, how the paragraphs are numbered? And it, it goes like that the whole way. It's one, two, three, four, all the way down. It, basically, if you wrote like this on an English assignment, you would be like shot out of a cannon or something. It's, 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 it's atrocious writing. But the reason they do that is so when they do the, uh, the responses to the complaints, they can do this, where they can go paragraph by paragraph and either affirm or deny or affirm in part and deny in part and so on and so forth. And the Kleins effectively deny just about everything other than like the dates and some of the obviously true stuff. Pretty much the Kleins denied everything. This is like one sample of it. Now a lot of the times they denied it because they had no knowledge of it. Like um, Haas is talking about you know, when he sought legal counsel and things like that, in which the clients have no way of knowing what is true and what is not. They said they have the knowledge, so they didn't have no knowledge, so they deny. And that puts the burden of proof on Haas to prove it. But another situation like this actually pertains to the defamation part of it. They just ran the board and denied absolutely everything, which you would expect. So where does that leave us? Well, we're kind of back to square one. We're back to basically right after the initial complaint was filed in the order of operations. We had this big tangled mess, and thanks to the agreement of the attorneys, we have a new complaint and a new response to the complaint, and we're probably soon going to get either a new motion to dismiss or a new motion for summary judgment, depending on how it goes. But the main difference, the main change in it all, is the addition of defamation to the lawsuit. So now Haas is suing for copyright infringement, DMCA misappropriation referring to the counter notice that the clients filed to Haas's DMCA notice ordering the removal of the work and now defamation. So three things on the play. And I'm going to be straight. I'm not much of a defamation guy. I, my background is in mass media law and ethics, so I do have some primer here, but this is not my area of expertise. But I will do my best for you guys to stay on top of that as well. So that's where we sit. Back kind of the square one, a new claim for relief, and a lot ahead of us. This case is going to be a long one, no matter how it shakes down. Anyway, so that's what's going on in the H3H3 lawsuit. Sorry this was a bit of a doozy of a video, but I hope you found it interesting and enlightening. Please do take a moment to subscribe, thumbs up, all that good stuff. I appreciate the help, and thank you all for your kind words below. I greatly appreciate it. And, and, you know, it's one of those videos. I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but I'm just going to give it to you as straight as I can. On that note, everyone, thank you very much for your time. Hope you found it useful. And until next time, this is Jonathan Bailey, signing off.